Welcome to Phylum Platyhelminthes, the flatworms. Identifying characteristics of the Phylum Platyhelminthes. They are bilaterally symmetric. They are motile and move generally via undulation. Some classes use a different method. More on this later. They are non-segmented versus earthworms. They're found in marine, freshwater, and damp terrestrial habitats, also moist environments inside a host. They are acelimates. They possess a gastrovascular cavity. In other words, they have a sac body plan, as in very much like periphera and cnidaria. When it comes to feeding, platyhelminthes wrap around prey, secrete mucus, and extend their pharynx to suck up food. Digestion occurs in the gastrovascular cavity, and internal nutrient transport happens via diffusion. This is the movement of particles from low concentration to high concentration. Much like what happens with dye when you put it in the water, it spreads over time. With regard to their nervous system, even though they're acelomates, platyhelminthes do have primitive organ systems for all life processes except circulation and respiration. Circulation and respiration are achieved through internal diffusion and diffusion of gases across the body surface, respectively. They have a bilateral nervous system with cephalization. For example, there's a concentration of nervous tissue at the head end, which appears like a primitive brain and nerves. Many species exhibit eye spots sensitive to light. They are hermaphroditic and can re reproduce sexually, although they almost never self-fertilize or they can reproduce asexually by regeneration. There are four classes of the phylum platyhelminthes. Turbillaria, which includes the small free-living flatworms where no host is required. Trematoda, which includes the flukes. And cestoda, which includes the tapeworms. Class Turbillaria, Planaria, also known as Dugesia tigrina. This is the genus species. They are freshwater free-living flatworm. They move by beating cilia and gliding on a film of mucus called ciliated gliding. They are 3 to 12 millimeters in size. They possess two eye spots, or ocelli, that are sensitive to light. They possess auricles, sensitive to chemicals. Pharynx is in the middle of the body for ingestion. Excretion is via flame cells, which act as primitive kidneys. How planaria regenerate is through asexual reproduction. Planarians will spontaneously detach the tail end of their bodies, and each half will regenerate into a full-size flatworm. Planarians can be cut either transversally, as shown above, or dorsally, and most will regenerate into a full-size worm. A super cool fact, the smallest piece of planarian to ever regenerate in a lab into a new planarian was one 279th of a planarian. That's approximately only 10,000 cells. Note, like all platyhelminthes, planaria can also reproduce sexually and are hermaphroditic. Planaria regeneration can also occur even if the worm's body is not completely severed. This figure demonstrates the growth of new tissue by neoblasts, which is triggered by amputation. Of the parasitic flatworms, there are two classes, tapeworms and flukes. They require a host to carry on their life cycle. The primary host is the one infected as an adult flatworm. Secondary host, they infect their host in the larval stage. With class cestoda, tapeworms, they have no digestive system. It absorbs the primary host's digested food through its skin. They're characterized by a scolex, which is basically the head, it has hooks and suckers to hold itself inside the gut. The body is an assembly line of square sections called proglottids. Each proglottid contains male and female sex organs. As proglottids mature and worms mate, proglottids break off. Unlike periphera and cnidaria, self-fertilization is rare but possible. Proglottids pass out of the host with feces and fertilized eggs are released. When animals eat food contaminated by feces from the primary host, eggs hatch into larvae that form cysts in muscles of the secondary host. When humans eat undercooked, infected meat, larvae can, attach, sorry, can hatch from cysts, attach to intestine, and grow to adulthood. 
making us primary hosts. The mode of transmission for them in secondary hosts, it can be large like cows, which transmit it to people, or small like fleas, which transmit it to pets, both of which may infe eat infected feces. The primary symptom for those who are infected by tapeworms is weight loss. It is diagnosed by a fecal exam treated with antiparasitic medicine. In prolonged infections, worm migrates to the eyes, heart, brain, lungs, liver, and they form cysts. Cysts cause swelling, cramps, diarrhea, anemia, and seizures. The pork tapeworm. It lacks sensory organs, coordination for mobility, and a digestive system, which means there's more room for reproductive structures. They have a modified epidermis, or tegument, which protects against the digestive enzymes and the immune systems of the host. They can reach seven meters in length in humans. They're flat and long, which maximizes absorption of nutrients from the host. Before antiparasitic medicine, how were parasitic worms treated? Aboriginal people, both in Canada and elsewhere, have several natural remedies for parasitic worms. They can use pumpkin seeds, which are especially effective against tapeworms because of a certain amino acid in them. They use butternut, also known as white walnut, because of its antiparasitic compounds and its laxative action, which expels the tapeworms. Or they use may apple, also being considered as an anti-cancer drug because it blocks cell division. One final fantastic flatworm fact, the largest tapeworm ever reported was in a sperm whale, which was 30 meters in length.